perfect. All right, so I'm Alison Cowan and I'm from Imperial College London. And this is my first Magnetic Interactions conference, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I'm gonna talk you through my poster, which is on magnetic recording of Earth's history, which describes a 3D nanoscale method for characterization of a single crystal, which was collected at the Glen Mountain. So by using practical and theoretical approaches, it allows us to accurately determine the behavior of natural samples, which will lead to more accurate paleo intensity estimates. So the key to predicting the magnetic response of a sample is in the detailed morphology distributions. And these can contain distributions of millions of particles, in this case, magnetite. And these all have different shapes and sizes, which defines their unique magnetic behavior and recording fidelity. So how do we measure these green sizes is we use a technique called slice and view, and we do this on an instrument, uh, FibSem. And what we do is we use the focused ion beam to mill a slice, and then we image the corresponding slice with the SEM. So what we can do is process these SEM images and realign them to produce a 3D reconstruction, like what we see here, where we can undertake some quantitative particle metrics. So what we're seeing here, it's quite an interesting distribution. So we are seeing a number of grains with a variety of different sizes. So we are seeing more of the regular simple ellipsoids that we would expect to see, but we're also seeing these uh, non-interacting, highly elongated particles that run pretty much the full slice thickness, which is nearly 2.5 microns, um, which, yeah, which, which is interesting. <laughs> um, so the combination of this uh, nanometer uh, tomography and the micromagnetic simulations here on the right allows us to better understand the link between the morphologies and the magnetic properties. So the resulting remnant states is what we see here. And this includes a single domain and single vortex, which are the two domain states that we would expect to dominate uh, the remnant magnetization in the vast majority of samples. But what's interesting here is that we're also seeing a, some multi-domain for these larger elongated particles. And um, so this is just a quick summary of what we've been working on at the moment. There's quite a lot uh, still to do, uh, mainly simulation work, uh, which includes hysteresis forks, uh, relaxation times. Uh, but that's what we've been working on at the moment. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I would love to speak to you. I've recently transferred from physics to uh, paleomagnetism, so <laughs> it would be lovely to speak to you. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, so anybody else want to jump in there? Okay, maybe I'll start to share my screen. Who? Yeah, um, Kasia Dudis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, do you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Uh, in the poster, I would like to present some work that I done last year when I was uh, on my research stay in Cambridge. And um, the motivation to this uh, study uh, was uh, great concern about environmental protections and uh, rehabilitation of the environment, especially after uh, mining exploration. And knowing that uh, heavy metals that are one of the major pollution, pollutants uh, in soils um, are associated with uh, magnetic particles, I thought that it might be a good idea to um, check uh, how those particles uh, behave in soils, if there are any trend uh, with time and so on. So uh, three former mining areas uh, that are located here uh, were sampled, I mean soils from that area were sampled to characterize magnetic mineralogy and find this correlation. Is there any actually between magnetic properties, magnetic finger fingerprints and ores that was exploited? Actually, uh, we sampled mainly soils uh, surrounding spoil heaps and mine waste, but also uh, soils developed on uh, those wastes called technosols. And uh, what can be seen from the results from thermomagnetic curves, the mineralogy is quite well diversified with uh, magnetite and hematite that 
are main magnetic phases, but also iron sulfides and probably machimite is also present here. And unfortunately, SI uh, M and X-ray diffraction wasn't much helpful in disentangling this mineralogy. However, uh, using fork PCA, we can observe that there is a diversification in terms of grain size of those uh, magnetic phases. Uh, however, there is a common thing uh, that is shown here. So in uh, both uh, technosols and soils surrounding uh, mine waste, we observed uh, quite distinct particles, not interacting SPSD uh, particles with varying coercivity that most likely is of anthropogenic origin and could be also uh, divided as uh, separate end members in uh, particular uh, sites, actually. And what is more important, uh, this particle seems to be uh, quite persistent as they uh, are present in a relatively unchanged form uh, in soils uh, that were developed uh, 50 years and 400 years ago. So, if you're interested in, if sorry, if you're interested, please join me in, in the poster hall. I'll be happy to answer all questions. Thanks. Okay, who's next in line? Anybody want to shout? Is that? I can go. Uh, hand up for Marcela there. Whenever you're ready. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so this project, it's uh, I'm a fourth year Earth Sciences student supervised by Rich Harrison as well and uh, Farhang Nabier. And uh, this, this project is part of an ongoing master's project. So I'm really just presenting the uh, like an overview and preliminary results. Um, so it's characterizing, broadly speaking, uh, the remnant magnet magnetic carriers in chondritic meteorites. And um, one of the main ways that we're doing this, or, or at least it's a, an emphasis of the project, is using micromagnetic modeling techniques. And um, it, it's basically applying the same methods as Alison Cohen's group on the Glen Mountain uh, crystal. Um, we're using focused ion beam, 3D tomography methods, and um, Merrill code for the micromagnetic simulations. <clears throat> and yeah, with, with uh, our case study sample is a C2 chondritic meteorite, this one, um, something which James Bryson has recently done a bit of work on, and last time I checked, he's, he's here. Um, we did some, we had a brief SEM session, and this, this is some backscatter images which I've pulled and put on here because they're some of the, the more unusual and interesting, they show some of the, the more interesting spatial distributions of iron rich phases. And I haven't, I haven't really yet looked beyond a few papers into this exactly how they relate to how they have formed and how they relate to um, some of the larger morphologies that the project is focused on. I'm not, not sure at all. So uh, that, that's if, if anyone has any ideas or wants to pass comment on that, um, come and find me. I'm also looking for PhD opportunities. So uh, but, but that's, that's the scope of, of the project. So yeah, I'll be in the, the poster hall after this. So anybody else want to jump in? Thanks for that, Ursula. Um, anybody want to shout? Uh, I'll go, but I want to wait a little second because there's some chickens in the garden that are shouting very loud. <laughs> so I don't want to bother anyone with that sound. But um, here's my poster. Um, Essentially, I've been looking at a series of mesoproterozoic giant dikes in southern Greenland. 
and I've particularly try, been trying to figure out their emplacement history and post emplacement mechanisms that have occurred by using rock magnetics. And so I titled it trying to, trying to decipher the primary flow from interstitial mouth migration. So I went out to, to Greenland to map, collect samples, and then did a bunch of photography and rock magnetics. Um, and I've been trying to trying to integrate a, a, a model or try to produce a petrogenic model of the, the system where we can, sorry, I've got lost my train of thought. So I've been trying to integrate the in-phase AMS and out-phase AMS um, using other rock magnetic techniques such as susceptibility experiments and ARM to try and figure out what um, magnetic clusters that the, these different uh, experiments are measuring. And ultimately what we've what I've gone into so far is that it seems like these giant dike systems which reach up to 800 meters wide probably didn't intrude as a classic penny-shaped crack dike, but more as a series of fingered lobes um, intruding and coalescing in an extensional regime. Um, and what I've trying to do following that now is to try and see we found some evidence that there's potentially some compaction occurring and there's evidence of melt segregation and so we think that maybe um, the finer grain uh, rock magnetic uh, clusters are recording these later stage migrations um, and we have some exciting clues that that does seem to be the case and that the outer phase and the ARM are indicating a, a secondary fabric that isn't recorded in the in-phase AMS. Um, and ultimately, the current interpretations that I have are that there, these systems are intruding in a series of convecting lobes that are later than um, post-deposition and crystallization. The last gasps are these interstitial melts that are almost filter crossed out. But if you're interested in anything that I've been talking about, in particular, if anyone has any ideas as to how I can further test um, what out of phase AMS is recording, please do um, come around and give me a shout. Cool, thanks a lot. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to pipe up or shout? I see a hand up from Rory there. Yeah, sure, I'll go next. Um, since I'm also looking at the younger giant dikes of Greenland. Uh, There we go, can you see my screen? Cool, so uh, yes, I'm also looking at the same area that Lot's looking at. Uh, Lot's area is down in this blue bit here called Tasarlatok, and I'm looking at an area just to the north at Sorotit. So um, basically this is part of the Gardar province of uh, Southern Greenland, and these are um, Neoproterozoic dikes, which were in place uh, during a uh, failed intercontinental rift environment and they reach up to 800 meters wide. And the interesting thing about these dikes are that they have these discrete domains within them um, of different either compositions or layering differences um, or both in some cases. And so I've been looking at places where the, the composition changes into these, these pods of more evolved composition. And so I've been doing an AMS study. I've, I've done three transects across this pod where we have troctolite at the margins going through Sinagabro to Port Sinite at the center. And um, preliminary results that I, I've found so far is that, um, so these, between these two pods, we have a, a, a numbering here. Um, and this looks like the, the pods are ref, uh, representing fingers which are inflating and pressing up against um, walls between the, the pods and then forming almost broken bridge structures um, as these uh, dikes coalesce and, um, and meet up, the, as these lobes meet up. Um, and uh, uh, also the lineations generally are pointing towards the northeast. Um, and just to uh, try and put this into a bit of context with this area, on the, in figure A, we have uh, essentially the area that Lot's looking at, which is uh, structurally deeper within the dike and um, we're seeing that the formation of, of layering and um, what I'm proposing uh, is that this uh, formation of layering and foliation 
uh, we have an interstitial melt formation, which then is migrating upwards in the dike um, and forming these um, zones of more evolved composition. And so these pods um, are formed through the, the secondary emplacement of material, which is formed from within this dike complex um, and is migrating upwards within it. Um, and so, yeah, I encourage any of you to come and check out my poster. A uh, lot very kindly put it right at the front. And yeah, please come and chat to me. This is my, uh, this is for my MGL undergraduate dissertation and it's very much still a work in progress. So I'd love to chat to anyone about my AMS data and TX results and um, these amazing giant dikes. Okay, is there anybody else? So um, actually, I have a poster as well. So I just want to very quickly go through it myself. So I'll just share my own screen, if you don't mind. Um, so can you guys see that? All right, two seconds. So are you, can you guys see that? Yeah, sure. Cool. So just in case, um, you, for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, my own name is Vincent Toomey. Um, I'm a final year PhD student here in University of St. Andrews uh, working with Will. Um, as part of my PhD here, I'm trying this new project. So I'm trying to uh, couple detailed structural mapping of uh, a magmatic body and linking it with paleomagnetic analysis. So effectively, just to kind of give you a quick update that when, you know, when a magma intrudes into a host rock structure, it forcefully intrudes into it and can buckle and bend the, the surrounding host rock around it and can ultimately produce these intrusion-induced force folds, which obviously form synchronously with the intrusion of the, the body. So um, I, the aim is to actually test this hypothesis where the, so the premise behind this hypothesis is to, um, is that the paleomagnetic analysis um, that the, the thermal remnant magnetization could be expected to successfully overprint the host rock primary remnant magnetization as the hot magma from the body increment, like incrementally injects and displaces that host rock. So like effectively as the pluton in places, the host rock will like, it, it, the pluton will in place and inflate. And so the, the, the TRM could be expected, like there, the, paleo, the subsequent paleomagnetic vectors could be expected to change over that. So ultimately the, the goal is, is to see that can the PMAG help like record this progressive and or even stepwise or punctuated host rock deformation during this incremental lacula construction. And in turn, can it actually constrain the rate and duration of cooling, particularly in rapidly in place bodies in the shallow crust. So some of me are familiar with this area in Eastern Iceland, Sandfell. So this is my study area. So basically this is just the preliminary analysis. So basically I collected a suite of PMAG samples along the structural aureole. And the reason why we went to Sandfell is that the actual exposure is very good. So you got these very well exposed intrusion induced force folds. And you can actually see that the actual dip value of these uh, lava, of the neogene lava piles in Eastern Iceland actually changes and actually steepens away from the contact. Um, so this is just the initial analysis. The, the next step for me, which is I'm effectively jumping into now, is do the PCA analysis and actually see if this um, PMAC data is actually worthy. Now the initial, like there are some little kinks in the data. So this actually could be showing the, the, the switch or, or, an, or an influence from the magma body. So if anybody has any, any kind of, input on you know any caveats or any advice or seen some similar project come to my poster um now i'm kind of abusing my power now as convening the session and instead of you know being at the pub last night i actually kind of put together a very quick poster that's not in the abstract but it's actually from another part of my phd that um that that I've actually submitted to the JALSOC before Christmas, so fingers crossed, but I just put this together quickly last night just to kind of show you what the work is. So as Will mentioned in his talk, um, that you know the AMS has been used for decades now to constrain magma flow dynamics and emplacement mechanisms. Um, however, 
a lot of the times it just it, it comes up with the actual internal dynamics of a magmatic body and it doesn't give much constraints in terms of what the the implications of these emplacement mechanisms actually have on subsequent or associated volcanism with these intrusive bodies. So again, similarly enough, I use detailed, you know, uh, like, you know, by combining structural mapping, drone work with AMS as a complement, I actually map out this, uh, another very well exposed um, subvolcanic silicic body in Iceland and actually map um, and do a, a pretty comprehensive AMS analysis with detailed structural mapping around its associated structural aureole. Now, the results I came out with with the AMS suite in the main body of the lacklet, again, is this kind of classic low bake structures where effectively the K1s are orientated along this northeast or uh, northeast southwest axis, which actually is quite comparable with the regional trend of the fault and fractures across within and beyond the structural aureole. Now, um, so the lobes are actually based on the wrapping around of the magnetic foliation uh, along the actual, the, 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 ver the pretty pervasive northeast southwest trend of the K1 values, which, the, you know, which actually show a range of uh, inclinations. Now, this is not new, and this has been published for, again, decades, going back to even Carl Stevenson, Don Hutton, all those guys, both, both using rock magnetics and geophysical techniques. But because they're coupling the AMS with the host rock deformation, the, I've actually managed to map out some uh, inclined sheets, which are directly offset from the laccolite, and doing a, a, an AMS suite within or around these, um, these inclined sheets. We actually can. We actually show how the how the magma true AMS now through the AMS data set how the magma actually migrates from this laterally flowing low bake structures that you see here. So this is a um, and how these actual so these inclined sheets which are actually paralleling the regional fault fracture trend. So in, in it, actually on the lateral flanks peripheral flanks of these low bake structures, which propagate out towards the west southwest of the area. The magma is shown to actually flow upwards through the classic invocation model, which Simon talked on yesterday, and also just through, um, like, you know, just through the, the paralleling or being sub parallel to the actual um, wall structure of these intrusions. So this, uh, this has implications for volcanism in terms of, you know, how this, this actually compares with geophysical observations where volcanic eruptions are actually laterally offset from the main magma body to which it's associated with. But again, this is not a poster which I just cheaply put up last night. So thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>